Dr. Ian Robinson, and I recently joined RPE as a fellow after completing my PhD at the University of Maryland. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the second part of our two-part webinar series on alternative battery materials for the next generation of EV batteries. Specifically, we're going to be looking at alternatives to lithium, nickel, and cobalt. With that, Dr. Hallie Cheeseman is going to speak to you about the alternatives on the anode side, and then I'm going to be talking to you about the alternatives on the cathode side, and then present our conclusions. If you would like to engage with us further and try and help solve these problems that are associated with these materials, I encourage you to either reach out to us directly at our contact information posted at the end of this webinar, or to actually fill out our teaming partner form that will be posted on the RPE website. With that, this is not a request for proposal, an FOA, or a BAA. Thank you, and I look forward to engaging with you further. Thank you, Ian. And in addition to your help in preparing this webinar, I want to acknowledge the help given to us by our contractor support, specifically Dr. Neil Golovin, Dr. Rose Kalhotra, and Dr. Sean Vale. Here is a summary of what we covered in the first webinar. RPE's mission is to work on the challenging problems. We're not seeking to do the easy, but to do the hard. An example of a challenging problem is getting the world to switch to electric vehicles. One of the innovations that's being pursued is lithium metal batteries, with the promise of longer range than today's lithium ion. Finally here, the first webinar highlighted the importance of charge time for lithium metal batteries and threw down the gauntlet of 15 minutes or faster. Now here is a summary of what we're going to cover in this webinar. We're going to move away from lithium, in fact. Lithium iron is very dependent on some critical materials. What other possibilities are there? EV range, a critical EV need, will always benefit from higher energy density materials. Anode alternatives for EVs are actually few, but aluminum and magnesium are certainly very interesting. Conversion-based cathodes offer potential performance improvements versus intercalation cathodes and may have better supply chain dynamics as well as lower cost. During my career, I was unfortunate to have to work through three very difficult business opportunities, difficulties relating to commodity supply and price volatility. Lithium ion batteries are very dependent on lithium, nickel, and cobalt, and it is clear, as shown in this data developed by Avicenne, that demand for these materials is going to challenge the global supply base substantially. By 2030, these graphs tell us that 80% of the cobalt, 20% of the nickel, and 80% of the lithium we currently produce will be used in lithium ion batteries. Ah, also, by 2030, only 10% of the vehicles being produced will be EVs. So moving towards 2040 and beyond, the situation will only get more challenging. The DOE is appropriately very focused on supply chain security for critical materials. And whether it is reducing cobalt or looking to bring lithium mining into the US, there is a lot of work going on in this area. This webinar attempts to look outside of this box and to re-ask the question, what is there that should receive consideration that is not lithium, nickel, or cobalt? We've all seen charts like the following using data compiled by the USGS that helps us to frame materials in terms of price and supply. These are the elements, with the exception of iodine, that are principally used in lithium ion today and also that are projected for use in the first lithium metal batteries. These are some of the alternatives we might consider as anode materials. They have higher availability and many of them are lower cost. On the cathode side, sulfur has received much attention and fluorides are beginning to be explored. These may be available in the Earth's crust, but as with all the halides, seawater may be the most prominent source. Batteries based on iodine, sitting over there on the left-hand side with current materials, bromine, chlorine, as well as fluorine, are certainly of interest. The one most available element on our planet is not listed here. 
Oxygen, of course, is a very relevant cathode material and not only finds great use in fuel cells, but elusive appeal in the holy grail of the battery world, the metal air battery. I put this chart together soon after I joined ARC-RE as a summary of the alternative materials for the battery applications that would be of interest to RPE and DOE. There are 13 different system possibilities listed, and of course there are other options in addition to these. The columns categorize three industrial and one transportation application group. You can agree or disagree with my individual assessments, and I'm sure many people will. But one conclusion is clear, and I believe it is indisputable. Industrial or stationary applications have multiple battery chemistry choices, but for EVs, the only choice today is a lithium-based solution, and therefore a future where there is an overwhelming dependence on lithium, nickel, and cobalt. So let's look at some of the anode material options that can challenge lithium in transportation applications. Here is a classic chart that summarizes energy densities, volumetric, gravimetric. And when it comes to EVs, the starting point is always energy density. Zinc is a wonderful material, well-known and in inexpensive. It is a great candidate for many industrial applications, but not for EVs. Sodium and potassium have an instant appeal but the data clearly says no when one sees that their energy density is dwarfed so much by lithium. It is only when we look at the divalent magnesium and trivalent aluminum that we see something that piques the interest. Any effort on behalf of EVs needs to be directed towards these two elements and let the effort on sodium, zinc and potassium be directed towards stationary applications. When I started working in the mid 80s, there was a news magazine that would come across my desk called EV News. Even back then, I remember seeing articles about aluminum batteries and thinking, oh, that's interesting. And that has very much been the repeating story for the last 30 years or so. Both aluminum and magnesium face the ultimate challenge as anode battery materials. To discharge, they must react. To be stable, have low self-discharge, low gassing, etc., we rely on a very robust protective film that stops them reacting. To react or not to react, that is the question. Oh, and they have to do that reversibly again and again. This chart talks about research activity for these two battery anode options. We all know that activity is not necessarily a predictor of progress, but that said, we can conclude that people are increasingly seeing this opportunity as important. Secondly, if this is a race, China wants to win it. Some very prominent US organizations have been working on both magnesium and aluminum. Our brief funded a magnesium project several years ago, and magnesium has received attention from other agencies and purposes. Lightweight, two electrons to give and reactive, it is widely used, albeit in alloys with other metals. On the downside, most magnesium is produced in China. In terms of supply chain, aluminum is far more attractive. Again, lightweight with three electrons to give, it is mined throughout the world and is also extensively recycled. In the ARPA-E 2018 Open FOA, we chose to invest in an aluminum battery project proposed and now being executed by ionic materials. They are employing a novel approach, enough said here, but there is no doubt in my mind that to unlock the potential of aluminum and magnesium, we're gonna to have to consider multiple and different approaches that leverage all of the very clever, intricate, and sometimes subtle material science that has been discovered and invented over the past 10 years. I call this the back to the future technology strategy. What technologies exist today that didn't exist yesterday, that we can apply to problems that we couldn't solve yesterday so that we can be successful in the future. With that final comment, I will hand over to Dr. Ian Robinson, who is going to talk about cathode materials. Thank you, Holly. Now I'm going to continue speaking about alternative cathode chemistries with some examples that have shown promise. 
Current commercial lithium ion battery cathodes are intercalation based in which lithium enters and exits the lattice of a cathode during cycling. These cathodes have specific sites for lithium to enter and exit. One of the big draws of an intercalation cathode is the high stability because of these distinct lithium conduction pathways. However, there are some limitations of the intercalation cathodes. Specifically, material supply is stated earlier and lower specific energy density and capacity compared to the conversion cathode. Most conversion cathodes contain earth abundant materials that have high potential energy density, making them a very attractive uh, next generation lithium ion battery cathode. So if we can capitalize on the benefits of a conversion cathode, we will have much cheaper batteries with higher capacity. Research on lithium ion battery cathodes has primarily been focused on intercalation cathode chemistries over the past 10 years, likely due to their commercial growth. Conversion cathode research has also seen growth over the past 10 years, but has been dominated by China as they see the potential of a conversion cathode for EVs. To be the global leader in the EV battery market, the US needs to recognize and develop the next generation of cathodes for rechargeable batteries and capitalize on the conversion chemistry energy density. We do have some of our top research or organizations working on alternative cathode chemistries. Specifically, the organizations on the left have devoted significant resources for developing commercial uh, conversion cathodes for specifically sulfides, iodides, and fluorides, among others. Some other groups have also reported overcoming a lot of the challenges associated with conversion cathodes, and RPE has even funded some of these exciting projects in the past on conversion cathodes. Specifically, Silo Nanotechnologies has um, done work on a lithium fluoride-based cathode. So if we could devote more resources to conversion type cathodes, we will have much higher energy density batteries batteries that can capitalize on cheap, abundant materials, reducing our dependence on critical materials like nickel and cobalt. So now in conclusion, we cannot deny lithium ion is a super, superb battery system. It behooves us to persist in our search for higher energy systems and com chemistries that lean into US independence for critical materials. Anodes based on aluminum or magnesium and conversion cathodes that use earth abundant materials could if we solve some tough technical problems, be opportunities for us to both achieve this and need to set up our US technological leadership for a whole new generation of batteries. We were thrilled to fund some of the alternative materials projects in the 2018 Open FOA, and we want to learn more about the possibilities in these future chemistries. We invite you to contact us at the email addresses listed if you would like to discuss further. The gauntlet is thrown down and to borrow and adapt a quote from one of, one of the many things JFK said, we choose not to do these things because they are easy. We know they are hard, but we must do them because we must.